Dateline, Salt Lake Herald Republican, December 11th, 1898. Quote, that Salt Lake City will have a salt palace next summer is now an assured fact. It all depended on the success of the experiments of the committee appointed to devise a method by which the structure of salt could be rendered waterproof, fireproof, and such that the salt would not melt. The greatest difficulty was to devise some means to prevent the melting of the salt, and this the committee has been successful in doing, as well as in the other requirements mentioned, to make the Salt Palace a success. End quote. I'm Wendy. This is Demolish Salt Lake and the story of the original Salt Palace. Hello and welcome to episode 19. We are back in the world of famed Utah architect Richard Kletting for this episode. Some of his work includes the Utah State Capitol building, the original Saltaire Resort at the Great Salt Lake, the McIntyre Block and Carrick Block in downtown Salt Lake, and a handful of buildings on the University of Utah campus. I could do an entire episode on Kletting's buildings and houses. Wes Long wrote a great cover story on Kletting in the City Weekly's October 6, 2021 issue. I'll put the link to the article in the show notes. This episode is about Kletting's Marvel, the original Salt Palace. Not only was this a stunning building, but it was made with actual salt from the Great Salt Lake and from Salina, Utah. Okay, let's dive in. The first mention of the Salt Palace in newspapers was in 1898. The city had a number of places for entertainment and leisure activities, but it lacked an exhibition hall. A group of local businessmen formed a committee to explore the feasibility of the project. One of those businessmen just happened to be Jacob Moritz. You can hear about him and the Salt Lake Brewing Company in episode eight. The committee worked with the Inland Crystal Salt Company to conduct experiments on how to spray lumber with a salt solution so it would stick. A bit about the Inland Crystal Salt Company. It was located on the south shore of the Great Salt Lake. The kiln at the plant was reported to be the largest salt drying kiln in the West until the 1920s. Morton Salt bought the company in 1927. According to an article from the Salt Lake Herald Republican, the plan was to erect the building with rough lumber, line the lumber with veneer, then spray powdered salt all over the surfaces with a high-pressured machine. The outside of the palace and other parts exposed to the elements would be sprayed with formaldehyde, making it rainproof and fireproof. Spoiler alert, it did not make it fireproof. The effect of the salt would make the building sparkle like it was covered in diamonds during the day, and at night it would be illuminated by hundreds of electric lights. I can imagine that it was pretty spectacular. The committee estimated it would cost about $50,000 to build the palace. Now that's about $1.7 million today. Now they just needed to secure the money. So they formed a stock company in early 1899 and set about convincing the public and local businesses to invest in the palace by buying stock. The capital stock was $50,000, divided into 5,000 shares of $10 each. In addition to the stocks, they raised money through events. In March of 1899, the state Senate passed a $10,000 appropriation bill for the Salt Palace, which Governor Wells immediately vetoed, citing, quote, the appropriation would be an unwarranted and illegal diversion of public funds, end quote. At this point, the committee had raised almost $13,000. Not to be deterred, they kept moving forward to raise the rest of the funds. The committee asked those who had already bought stock to consider purchasing more. And it worked. Even the railroad companies bought into it. In one month, an additional $12,000 was raised. Even individual community members bought in at $5 to $10, which I'm sure was a lot of money for them. In April of 1899, the Utah Salt Palace Association was formed. With plans moving forward, it was now time to pick a site. Pioneer Square on 4th South between 2nd and 3rd West was the preferred spot, while others favored the southwest corner of Liberty Park on 900 South. Both sites were eventually taken off the table. That's when the Walker Brothers, along with Frederick Heath, 
offered up a city block on 900 South between Main and State Street. A two-year lease with a rental fee of $1 a year was quickly signed. Cletting released his plans for the palace grounds on May 9, 1899. The grounds would have entrances on the north, east, and west sides. A one-fourth mile oval bicycle track would be on the northwest corner. A baseball field on the northeast corner. The palace itself would sit just south of the center of the block with a lake and a midway on the south side. Just one day later, it was announced that the lake and the baseball field were nixed. There just wasn't enough money to make it all happen. In testing the soil, it was found to be too swampy for the palace to sit directly on the ground, so adjustments had to be made for pilings under the building to lift it off the ground. Of course, this came with additional costs. And remember, as of right now, the committee still had not secured all the necessary funds. This will come back to bite them in the not-so-distant future. The bicycle track was complete in early July of 1899, and was the first track of its kind in Salt Lake City. The day it was finished, it was opened up to the public for anyone daring enough to give it a try. An article in the Salt Lake Tribune described the track as, quote, an eight-lap board track. The inside of the track is one-eighth of a mile in length. The center line, running from end to end, is 247 feet, and the width is 137 feet. The home stretch is 110 feet long by 20 feet wide. The back stretch is the same length, but only 14 feet wide. The turns are 14 feet wide with the outside perpendicular line 11 feet high. The back stretch is banked 14 base to 6.5 perpendicular. The home stretch has less of a grade at the base and is 20 feet to 6.5. From the turn at the head of the home stretch to the tape is a distance of 86 feet. The men will start just 24 feet from the turn going out of the home stretch when they will run into the steep bank, end quote. The track could hold about 4,000 spectators who sat around the top. Some even sat inside the track and hoped that a racer didn't lose control and come crashing down on them. The first race was held July 7, 1899, and proved that this track could be one of the fastest in the country. Cletting designed the palace in the Beaux-Arts classicism style. This is an over-the-top, ornate, and theatrical style. Some of its characteristics are columns, cornices, symmetry, pavilions, and statues of figures on the building itself. The Salt Palace had all of this. Plus, it was covered in salt inside and out. Now, I already explained how the exterior was sprayed with salt, but for the interior, the large wall panels and moldings were soaked in a super-saturated brine until salt crystals formed. Once that happened, they were removed from the brine and installed in the building. Rock salt slabs, which came from salt mines in Solana, Utah, were cut into pillars and arches. The building was a pavilion-style structure capped with a huge dome. The roof of the porch had 30 ornate cornices, each with a flagpole. String lights were draped from flagpole to flagpole. A sculpture made by local artist Jay Jefferson, representing Liberty, was placed on top of the front entrance. Rows of wooden steps led onto an 18-foot-wide porch entrance on both the front and the back of the building. The outside was incredible, and the inside was just as spectacular. All the salt inside the building was either left white or colored in blue, yellow, or brown. The basement housed concessions. The main floor contained a square exhibition hall where products made in Utah were displayed. The third floor consisted of a circular auditorium 108 feet in diameter, 900 lights covered in salt crystals were set throughout the dome, and each of the 16 panels on the dome bore the names of a western state. At the base of the dome was a balcony 25 feet off the floor, decorated with figurines. In the center of the auditorium was a dance floor and a stage for plays and concerts. The entire cost of the building was around $60,000. 
wiring for the 3,000 plus lights cost over $3,000, and running water lines down Main and State Street was another $25,000. So we're talking close to $90,000 for the entire build. Finally, on August 22nd, 1899, the long-awaited Salt Palace opened. The Salt Palace Association Board President, W.A. Neldon, spoke, as well as Governor Wells and others. They spoke of the work accomplished, obstacles overcome, dreams imagined, and hopes for the future of the palace. A few days later, on August 25th, Around 6,000 people showed up for the grand opening of the Midway attractions. The Salt Lake Herald Republican likened it to the World's Fair. Some of the attractions were Hagenbach's Wild Animal Show with his beloved tigers, the Streets of Cairo with a muscle dancer, a Japanese troupe of jugglers, Trimble the Aeronaut, a miniature railway that carried around 100 passengers, and my personal favorite, Dandy the dog. I found a little article about Dandy that stated, quote, There are dogs and dogs, but Dandy is the dandy of all dogs. The little fellow scales a ladder 65 feet high and at the word of command calmly dives to a net near the ground below. A wonderful feet, wonderful dog, end quote. Now, remember how I said the choice to move forward on the palace despite not having all the funds would come back to bite the association? Well, the palace did not bring in enough money in its inaugural season to pay its outstanding $21,000 debt. So, five months after the grand opening, the palace and all its attractions were sold for $18,000 at a sheriff's sale to O.D. Romney. Can you imagine the disappointment in the Salt Palace Association to lose this building after everything they went through to build it? It must have been a pretty hard blow for them. Romney promised to turn the Salt Palace into a moneymaker. He would fix up the bicycle track and improve the midway attractions and concessions. He reopened the palace on June 3rd, 1900 with a big circus and parade. In addition, there were vaudeville acts, rides, for the children and free dancing in the rotunda of the building. The next year, in September of 1901, still running at a loss, the Salt Palace changed hands again. This time, Walker and Heath, the owners of the land, took possession. Later, Heath would become the sole owner. Over the years, the Salt Palace was enjoyed by those attending bicycle races, vaudeville acts, plays, dances, and other attractions. It was even host to a steam-powered carousel at one time. In the early morning of August 29, 1910, the Salt Palace, some of the bicycle track, and adjacent buildings caught fire. According to a Salt Lake Herald Republican article, the fire was discovered by watchman R.C. Condy, who alerted the fire department. Just prior to that, it was reported to the fire department by a policeman. But his report was not taken seriously, It wasn't until Heath himself alerted the fire department that action was finally taken. The Salt Palace was completely destroyed. Not only did this affect Heath, but also the concession owners and others who had businesses in the palace. Some had insurance to cover their losses, and others, like Heath, did not. The cause of the fire was defective wiring in an electric concession. After the fire... There was talk of rebuilding the Grand Palace, but that would never happen. The Salt Palace was gone after only 11 years. In November 1910, Heath leased the site, including all the remaining features and the bicycle track, to Gust Ling, a local saloon owner, for the term of five years. Ling applied for a liquor license for a saloon on the grounds, but was denied by the city council after pressure from Women's America Club. It seems they did not like the idea of a saloon on the same site as public dances. It was either public dances or beer, and Ling chose public dances. The Sanborn Fire Insurance map from 1911 shows a bicycle saucer track, beer hall, and dance pavilion on the site. I'm assuming the beer hall was where the concessions were located because the strongest drink served in 1911 was soda. In 1913, 
Joseph Nelson and J.E. Langford acquired the lease and set about building what they would call Majestic Park. This new park would feature a 40,000 square foot cover dancing pavilion surrounded by a promenade. This pavilion was designed by Bernard Mecklenburg, who also designed the Maryland Apartments at 839 E South Temple, the St. Patrick Catholic Church on 105 West 400 South, and the Broadway Hotel at 222 West Broadway. The bicycle track was leased to Harry Hegren, and he would be in charge of it moving forward. The new pavilion opened in June of 1913 and continued to be a popular dance spot. A fire completely destroyed the bicycle track on June 5, 1914. Although Langford said he would rebuild the track, that plan never came to fruition. He did, however, build a baseball park in 1915 where the Salt Lake Pacific Coast League played. This ballpark almost became the home of Salt Lake Bees in 1925, but a new ballpark, eventually named Dirks Field, was built a few blocks south. Today, this is Smith's ballpark and once again home to the Salt Lake Bees. In 1915, Langford announced more improvements, such as a 300-foot replica of the Eiffel Tower, carousel, swimming pool, roller coaster, skating rink, and more. This new park was to be designed by James Carey, who designed Luna Park at Coney Island. But none of it was ever built. The dance hall collapsed under the weight of snow in March of 1916. It was rebuilt for $46,000 in October of that same year and opened as a semi-indoor skating rink and dance hall. In November 1916, it was announced that Majestic Park was no more and would now be known as Bonneville Park. The beer garden burned down in January 1917. In 25, Heath sold the northern portion of the Bonneville Park property to Richardson Bauer Incorporated, a distributor of Dodge Automobiles, for $35,000. Richardson took the corner lot on 9th South and State Street for an 87,000 square foot space for shops and sales rooms, Kreger Wire and Ironworks took the adjoining lot to the west for a model plant, and a service station was built on the corner of 900 South and Main Street. Kreger Wire and Ironworks was started by Samuel E. Kreger in Ogden, Utah in 1890. He moved the company to Salt Lake in 1892, where it grew to be the major producer of iron fencing in the state. Most of the iron fences in the avenues were produced by Kreger, and some of those fences still stand today. So the dance hall, now called Roseland Hall, continued to operate until November 19th, 1932, when it was destroyed by, you guessed it, fire. This is the third fire so far in this episode, and there are still more to come. Anyway, the fire gutted the dance hall and the attached lunchroom. Two firemen suffered minor burns, and a boy was cut on the right hand when he fired a sawed-off shotgun he found in the smoking embers. Now, I want to talk about some of the buildings that came after this fire in 1932. First up is the Grand Central Store that opened in 1940. I will tell you, I spent way too much time trying to figure out the history of this store, mostly because I had it mixed up and wasn't looking in the right direction. I have to give a huge shout-out to my dad for helping me put all of this history in place. He worked at Kreger Wire and Iron in the 60s and saw all the many changes to this block. And if you follow me on Twitter, you saw the saga play out in real time. So after getting the history straight and digging through newspaper articles, I learned some pretty cool stuff about Grand Central. Mari Warshaw emigrated with his Jewish parents to the U.S. in the early 1900s. He started out at a Jewish colony in Clarion, Utah. When that colony failed, he came to Salt Lake and worked hard as a trash collector and selling fruit from a cart to earn enough money to open a produce stand at 920 South Main Street in the 1930s. He called his stand Grand Central. In November of 1940, he spent over $70,000 to remodel a building just around the corner at 24 East, 900 South, into a 20,000-square-foot market. His original market at 1920 South Main Street, 
due to be demolished, was raised by fire just before the new store opened. Fire number four. In an article from the Salt Lake Telegram announcing the opening, Warshaw stated, quote, We have incorporated the best features of famous markets in all sections of the nation in this new market and added to these some of our own ideas, end quote. Some of these features included illuminated signs pointing to each department, spacious aisles, huge bakery, and large meat, fruit, and vegetable departments. This was an impressive market for the time, and Warshaw continued to grow the business opening Grand Central stores throughout Utah. In 1959, he built a larger store one block east at 900 South and State Street. Before all the inventory could be moved to the new store, a fire broke out on July 23, 1959, causing upwards of $500,000 damage and destroying the original market building. Fire number five. It was speculated that the fire started in the fireworks section on the second floor. All employees made it out and no one was injured. An article from the Salt Lake Tribune about the fire stated that Warshaw watched the building burn down with tears in his eyes. Safeway came along in the summer of 1962 with an amazing mid-century modern design store. I'll post pictures on my social so you can see it. This was touted as the, quote, most scientific superfood market you have ever seen, end quote. An advertisement in the Salt Lake Tribune about the store opening in July of 62 highlighted a huge parking lot, beautiful landscaping, reach-in air-conditioned cases, nine brand new procedure checkout stands, 102 lineal feet of refrigerated fruit and vegetable displays, the largest and most complete frozen food display in town, complete bake shop and self-service poultry and seafood section. During its grand opening celebration, one could even enter to win grand prizes, like a 19-inch Sylvania portable TV complete with rollabout stand, GE portable mixers with knife sharpeners, health-o-meter bath scales, <laughs> that is such a great name, sessions alarm clocks and transistor radio, and a deluxe pruning set. I mean, if I were alive back then, I would definitely have hit up this store. It sounds pretty amazing. Over the years, other buildings on this site have come and gone. Craiger Wire and Ironworks no longer stands, neither does the service station. Today, Ken Garf Honda downtown occupies the entire block. But if you look closely, you'll see clues of the past. The sign for Ken Garf Body Shop sits at the top of the old Safeway sign, and the Ken Garf Body and Glass occupies the old Safeway store. So not all of the history of 900 South between State and Main Street has been lost. As always, make sure to check out my Instagram and Facebook pages at Demolish Salt Lake Podcast to see pictures of the Salt Palace and the other buildings that I talked about in this episode. You can also follow me on Twitter at Demolish SL Pod. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe. Thanks for listening, and I will see you soon. Thank you.